just so you guys maybe just a little level set here in terms of how this all works. Normally I like, you know, the crowd interaction and people, you know, shouting their questions from the audience, certainly with this uh, virtual environment, you can't do that so much, but we do have both a chat and a questions and answers. If you uh, have across the bottom, you should see both of those as well. So go ahead and type your questions in there, happy to help. Um, there was one about the link to the registration for uh, on that previous slide. Certainly, I think Victor uh, and team will send out all the information about the registration uh, and, and links, as well as this entire presentation will be made available as well after as well. Uh, so with that being said, um, I had the wonderful chance to talk to you, uh, to some of you in uh, Santa Monica back in February with a, I would say a similar title, but if you attended that, uh, no worries, we have brand new content here as well. So uh, this isn't a duplicate of that presentation, I have entirely new content here. Uh, I do like to reuse the same titles because uh, sometimes I'm only marginally uh, creative. So I thought this one was one of my better ones. So use this as much as I can for my different presentations as well. Uh, so with that, thank you all for taking some time today and for those listening on a recorded uh, session in the future. Um, hello from the past and thank you so much for taking the time to uh, listen to this uh, webinar as well. Uh, so my name is Jason Dablo. I'm a cloud security advisor. Um, my contact information here is on the screen. I love to make connections on LinkedIn. Uh, it is my main uh, social sharing platform. So I do share a lot of threat intelligence content about security industry as a whole um, and really try to provide, uh, you know, the, the followers of that with uh, some kind of pertinent information and, and news and things that are happening all, all along the security space. Uh, so I've been in the security space for over 20 years. Um, I've been focused on container security for the last five or so. Um, really spent the last three plus years talking uh, about DevOps and, and really hearing how teams, I would say, are struggling for the most part in terms of in either implementing security within DevOps processes or security teams struggling with making that connection to developers. It's really uh, what this talk is focused on. It is, uh, I'd say, a bit of a 100 level talk, at least to the start, but um, certainly I can go as deep as you would like in terms of technical questions. So feel free to, uh, if you want some more expansion on some topics, we can certainly do that as well. Um, one of my biggest things is also uh, helping people. Uh, I am, you know, that guy, high emotional I, uh, EQ uh, person. So I, I do enjoy really helping people um, and really helping them along whatever journey they're on, uh, particularly in this space, talking about uh, cloud security or uh, overall security in general. Uh, so to start, I'm just gonna kind of level set about uh, DevOps, kind of what it is. I know probably you guys have heard this a lot, um, not just maybe DevOps, but DevSecOps and things like that as well. Um, I'm gonna just, throw out some concepts here, just kind of level set, and then we'll kind of get into the security bit towards the end. Um, this is also part of a, a five part webinar. So I'll be expanding with some hands on demos later this year on different technologies. So you can really get uh, really get your hands on different technology focuses and, and uh, really play with the technology that I'll be uh, talking about today. But ultimately it's up to you to really extend that olive branch for those of you in uh, security engineer positions or infosec teams to really reach out to the development teams and that's really kind of the focus of this talk. Uh, I think a lot of people I should say that uh, I know making a little bit of assumption but uh, most people have probably seen uh, this infinity loop here which represents the continuous in integration collaboration testing deployment and making sure that all of these pieces are continuously done. Uh, it's all about having feedback at each step. So that uh, continuous feedback in the middle is super important. So each kind of step or stage that you take along this journey, we wanna make sure that we have that feedback so you can continually improve not just the process, but the technology or value you're delivering to customers along this journey as well. Uh, Gardner uh, and others have an interesting kind of um, description when it comes to uh, DevOps. Um, I really like this 
a change in IT culture. Um, if anyone uh, has read the book, The Phoenix Project, it's all about that kind of change. They just released a new book, I believe, just a couple months ago called The Unicorn Project, uh, same author and same kind of problems that they've, uh, it's the next stage, I would say, of that business transformation as they've incorporated DevOps processes throughout the business. Um, really interesting book, and, and if someone hasn't had the chance to read it, it actually gives you a really good perception of this change in IT culture and really how, uh, how businesses need to really come together to all uh, back this DevOps transformation in terms for it to be successful within a particular environment. So uh, rewinding time a little bit here, uh, when we had both developers or operations, and maybe we're not rewinding time at all, this could be how your current uh, business is organized today. Uh, with developers and operations as separate teams, they each have kind of their, I would, I would say their specific uh, focus of duties of what they're trying to do. So on the left side or the development tree, they're responsible for that product, right? So the product or software that they're building, your company is building to establish either uh, internal uh, organization needs or external to help sell this uh, piece of software into the business. Uh, your, your developers are frontline in terms of creating that product that you're delivering or the infrastructure to, uh, to essentially the, the backend software that allows your business to continually run. Uh, whereas operation teams are really focused on the operations of that software. So perhaps the infrastructure or managing your tool sets or the servers that are in use. Um, and really here, the one at the bottom, which also carries into security as well, is making sure that you have that availability. So again, you have that three pillars of security, CIA. Um, a being availability and really oftentimes overlooked by security teams. We wanna make sure that we bring that back in and as, as it is in terms of operations, that's their biggest focus uh, here as well. But what happens is you have all of these teams doing separate functions here, uh, both with uh, developers as well as operations and the dollars that are associated with having people being very specialized in each of these as well. In terms of tool sets, you have separate tool sets here that developers would use, um, as well as ones with the operations or infrastructure team might use as well. But the nice thing about these tools is they can actually be interchanged where uh, operations teams might be using things like Docker within their environments to making sure that uh, things are launching in containers. They might be also interested or using that tool within their space. And developers might be writing code for Chef, like cookbooks or uh, you know, infrastructure as code within AWS or GCP. Uh, so there is some kind of interoperability between the tool sets that these two teams would be using. But what we've seen is virtualization is you know, everywhere, as we all know. Um, there is definitely some pros and cons when you're talking about virtual machines. Um, so certainly, uh, as when you're comparing them to physical servers, uh, having a virtual machine that can run multiple operating systems or uh, multiple uh, applications on a single piece of hardware is one of the nice pieces about virtualization. You get more return of investment on the hardware that you've that you've already used. That technical debt that you use to purchase hardware can now be. Uh, spread a little bit better in terms of not just having one physical server for one application, but with virtualization, you allow that to spread uh, multiple ways. There's certainly cons here as well. Um, you know, as we've looked at, and as I'll dive in further with this presentation, you'll, you'll see that uh, with the ad adoption of container technology, there's a lot of overhead even with virtual machines that we can actually save by moving platforms as well. Uh, so again, the dollar comes in here in terms of that technical debt that we've made in terms of investment. Uh, but let's see if we can kind of uh, improve that even more. Uh, so here's a typical architecture, um, and it's going to be a theme of not just this webinar, but multiple ones to, to, uh, to follow in the coming months. 
um, is really looking at different architectures and really how to architect the security within these different architectures as well. So for this example, you would notice that you would have VMware with that your ops or infrastructure team is managing. You can click deploy templates and basically watch and monitor the resource usage within a virtualized environment. That's one of the great things about VMware is it gives you a uh, consolidation of tool sets, um, you know, like monitoring or the software defined networking uh, or the hypervisor space, uh, a lot of con uh, consolidation of that to visibility. So uh, less and less team members have to actually watch or be involved into that process. So when you're talking about big development teams, they need something also to say consolidate the, uh, the what the operations teams were doing in terms of consolidating uh, physical machines into virtualization. How do big development teams consolidate their code into, uh, into manageable pieces as well? So in this uh, example here, you're bringing in tools like a code repository, uh, typically known as a Git repo. Uh, you have Git, uh, Git, GitHub on the left, excuse me, and Git Labs on the right, the Fox. Uh, so these two um, icons are typically used in terms of software for Git repos. A Git repo is just really where the code is committed that the developers are creating. So they're writing the source code, and then they commit it, and now you have a version tracked change uh, of that source. So you can quickly say move backwards or forwards, uh, but everything is kept aligned with all of the changes that are made, what the changes are. And then from that code repository, you would have a builder in the old days. So uh, a person of the development team would then take those committed code changes and build them into an application, and then either install that application into a virtual machine that the operations team provided, or uh, in some, they might also say deploy the uh, virtual machine as well, but uh, not in this instance where these teams are completely separate. You would have just the code builder throwing the code over the fence once the application is built directly to the operations team to then uh, build that onto a virtual machine. But there's a few problems with this type of design where you have kind of everyone throwing stuff over. So if say something breaks in the test environment, uh, the VM team or the, excuse me, the application team sees that that's a problem and maybe it's a problem with a configuration on the operation side. So a firewall rule or something similar uh, or the operations team seeing applications try to request uh, way more resources than what they requ initially requested, and now they're throwing back to say, hey, why is your application running so out of control? So you have, when you have people on both sides, you end up having more features uh, to actually handle for each one of those people. So each person on the development side would have features that they need to have and take control of. Uh, each one of these features, you might introduce more bugs into that cycle. The bugs that are introduced now take additional time to uh, figure out because again, you have that separation of teams. Uh, this downtime results in less money and less money equals lower growth for that business. So ultimately what we're trying to achieve here is making sure that we accelerate that value that we're delivering to the customers through this DevOps processes. And let's see how we can start achieving that here. Uh, we see a lot of shift left or shifting left, shifting security left, everything is shifting left. What that, event, what that means is if you go, think back to that infinity loop, all of the build and code committing stuff that the developers do is all on that left hand side. So to put it kind of graphically, you have as you move security or move things closer to the development process, so closer to the code, you actually eliminate, or not eliminate, but you lower the, both the cost and time required to find and identify problems. Uh, there was some research done uh, last year that said on the right-hand side, uh, finding and fixing something in production is 40 times the cost uh, as it was if you had fixed it in the development stages. Because it could be just a line of code or a comma that was left in that now makes it vulnerable and perhaps now you have open vulnerabilities within this application that are now being exploited. 
uh, and the tools of cost associated with production or runtime tools uh, is much uh, greater than say a developer using, um, you know, removing that language or use, doing some unit tests or things like that. So with that being said, the earlier that you can find problems, you actually are creating value within uh, your pipelines without actually having to say deploy or run different types of technologies as well. So now what we have here is a, an example of a continuous integration, continuous deployment or delivery tool set. Uh, at the top here, that waiter, he's known as Jenkins. Um, and what he's responsible for is really taking those code commits, building that into the application, and then delivering it into a production environment or a test environment. It can also handle things like making sure that the test is all automated, as well as the notifications back to developers. So you have this uh, overarching uh, software delivery lifecycle uh, management tool that allows you to give your developers visibility across both the development pipeline as well as the deployment pipeline and making sure that the VMs are reacting as development is expecting to and really automating also that delivery, deployment, testing, as well as the notification back into that feed as well. The, uh, a question came in on the, the 40x cost to fix bug in production. Uh, I'll double check, I thought it was Gartner, but I will, I will look up, I have the reference on another slide deck and I'll be sure to share that after uh, with that as well. So I appreciate that question, thank you. Uh, so what we are finding is despite this continuous integration software uh, and the ability to basically start automating some of the practices what we still have is this uh, giant, uh, giant VM, uh, I'll call it, looming here. Uh, we're still using a lot of resources that are unused in a virtualized environment. And this is due to that guest operating system that exists within, the, uh, within this platform, right? So while you can divvy up the uh, hardware requirements within, uh, uh, within each individual virtual machine. So each one can have a sliver of that hardware, uh, of, the, of the physical hardware. You still have that, that, go ahead, that guest OS on each VM that takes up a considerable amount of resources just to run the operating system itself. So uh, while containers have been around for quite some time, uh, you know, longer than I think 20, 30 years, uh, part of a Linux subsystem for quite some time. Uh, they've grown in popularity today for one key reason. Um, and that reason is it eliminates that guest OS from each individual image and allows developers really to just focus on the microservices of their particular application. If you think of it like a puzzle and each uh, developer uh, basically gets a little corner that will automatically work and connect to all the other pieces without having to say, reach over each other. Uh, each, each person has a little piece of the puzzle in front of them. They fix just the microservice and then they all communicate seamlessly without actually having to um, you know, adjust the entire monolith. At Trend Micro, we have a, um, an internal program here called Break Up the Monolith, uh, one of our pieces of software. Um, is a monolithic design, but it is protecting container environments today. But what we're trying to do is actually uh, break up that application into smaller pieces, a containerized platform, so we can actually unify uh, and help accelerate the customer's experience in terms of, of installation and usability. Because we, if we need to, say, add some new features or functionality to a specific piece, uh, we only need to make a change to that particular piece instead of making a change to the overall giant piece of software. Uh, if you look at, say, something on the left, if you're trying to make a change to, um, and this uh, basically represents a monolithic application, if you tried to make changes or increase the capacity of some of the things, 
you would end up impacting other pieces within it because it no longer fits in a way that uh, the original software was designed to run. Uh, so this is really where the containers allow us to build faster because you're eliminating a lot of the dependencies required to actually run the application uh, that would typically be stored in the guest operating system of a VM and allows you really to focus on just building the applications and the libraries associated with them and package them in a, in a, a nice little compact space that then fits and can run anywhere within that environment as well. So here's a couple examples of why containers are important down below. Uh, so things like being portable or scalable, you can move them, you have, uh, th they can run on any type of environment that shares the same operating system. You have the uh, ability to uh, make them interchangeable, they're super lightweight, they can speed up deployments, um, and really easy to configure and use as well. Uh, here's some of the stats uh, that we've seen in terms of how Docker, which uh, is a container platform, uh, how Docker and what it can do for your business. So some stats here, this is taken specifically from Docker, so they could be a little biased, of course. But uh, overall, you're looking at tremendous increases in uh, performance and acceleration of delivery, um, as well as resource utilization uh, goes down as well. So you can really make sure that you uh, can continue to use and get a better return of investment on that hardware that you've already purchased. Uh, of course, this still runs in on-premise hardware environments. You can have virtualized container uh, environments as well. So a container system running on a VM, which can also help accelerate, uh, accelerate your business and give you that uh, return of investment on that hardware purchase as well. So as I mentioned, this is the uh, difference between VMs and containers. You have the, uh, essentially on the left, you have your virtual machines and you can see that the the largest piece of this is that guest operating system because you have uh, resources in use to really making sure that the operational, the operating system uh, that exists on each one of the uh, virtual machines uh, has to all be there, has to be patched, has to include all of the things that make a, uh, a system run, as well as all the dependencies, the libraries and things like that as well. Whereas in containers, you're actually putting that oh, the operating system onto the host and using that. So uh, a Linux host can run Linux containers um, because they all share very similar design in terms of the kernel and what the kernel is able to accomplish from the operating system. You can eliminate all of those dependencies from the containers themselves. So again, the containers become super lightweight um, and very agile in terms of focusing the development effort just on the, uh, the bins and libraries that you need, and then building your application on top of that. So for a step-by-step -step to create a VM, you would go through these steps, uh, you know, install the operating system, apply all your patches, install the libraries that are required for your application. Maybe this is a SQL Server or IIS or some other type of framework in a Windows environment. Uh, you, you would have the same thing in a Linux environment, so uh, libraries that, uh, that the uh, application needs to use, uh, as well as the dependencies. You would then install your applications. It could be several, could be one, depending on how focused your um, application is. In terms of a monolithic app, it's probably just the single app on a single VM. Uh, you would then create that gold image, um, and then you would deploy that uh, VM from the image, and now you have a running virtual machine based on uh, the application that you would like to run within the environment. But uh, in terms of updating that, you would have to break or essentially deploy a VM, make all the changes that you would like, and then create a new uh, gold image from that, and then shut it down and del delete the old ones. Um, a little bit of an arduous process there in terms of making sure that your 
uh, making sure that your VMs are constantly updated with patches as they're coming out and things like that as well. When you're talking about a step-by-step -step to create a container, and um, for those of you that want to go a little more technical, I do have some examples here of a Docker file in the coming slides as well. So you write this Docker file, which is t uh, essentially gives its like an instructions on how to build it, uh, but there are you know, a few words of code that basically then executes into something that happens. Uh, you would then build the Docker image from that Docker file, which is then stored in a registry. Think of a registry as uh, just an inventory of all your images prior to them launching into deployment. So it's just a way to kind of catalog the different container images that you've built. Uh, and then finally, you would deploy that Docker container from the image. Uh, and again, because you don't have to worry about uh, operating systems or dependencies or installing patches, that could just go and start running immediately there. So Docker images, they're layer-based. Uh, so every Docker file line creates a uh, layer. So think of it like, um, you know, the, uh, I don't know, like an onion example. Uh, that's the first one that popped into my mind. I apologize, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, as each, as you write one line, you have a specific layer that gets added to a container. These layers could also be other containers. So you could pull in a container infrastructure inside a base, uh, base layer as well. Uh, this is done a lot of times. Um, so in terms of like open source, maybe you're bringing in um, just one particular container, but that container also has 10 other dependencies, which it then brings in. So you could have you know, 10 lines of code turning into 4,000 based on the dependencies as well. So you can get really specific in terms of these layers and the dependencies, um, but really making sure that these layers in terms of as they're de developed and deployed, uh, all fit within each other to actually run this application within the container. Uh, so here's kind of an example here. So you have a uh, container uh, layer that is read-write, and then each of the image layers might have some type of uh, technology that it's bringing in, maybe a library, maybe an application that's being installed, um, all built again on a singular operating system that the container host is running. Uh, so this is where I mentioned that you can also bring in other uh, Dockers as layers. Um, so you can really continue to embed uh, more and more images inside a container platform that allows you really the infinite flexibility as well as the ease of use. So you don't have to recreate the rule, to, uh, the, the re recreate the wheel in terms of, well, I need a, a, a Apache web server. Am I going to go and install it all through the Docker file? Or let me just pull in an Apache container that already does all of those dependencies as well. So allows you to very quickly, again, to do some code reuse specifically from public registries to allow you to really get up and running very, very quickly as well. Uh, here's a kind of a graphical uh, explanation of that as well. So each one of the image layers might call a specific file, and then it all gets essentially compiled as a top layer once the image is built that then allows access to all of the different files libraries, dependencies, applications that you built at each layer. And for a more visual, uh, for me, I'm super visual, so um, this slide really works for me as well. So um, essentially you have that top level, you're bringing in the languages that you need, and then you're bringing in the applications uh, that, um, that, that are supported by those uh, languages as well. Uh, so here's a sample Docker file. So for the base image at the very top, you would say, well, I need a node image, so let's pull node 11. So now node 11 is on that first layer, and now you're defining the user for uh, that particular install of node. Uh, you would then, uh, here on the next layer, you have it making a directory as a working directory, uh, and then installing the uh, one of the depend uh, the one of the dependencies Axios, um, copying that to your app. Uh, so you're copying just basically your app directory into the working directory, which is your node slash app. 
And then you're creating the project and now you have a running node application with its dependency already loaded. And this can be then sent to deployment. It will automatically deploy and run your project and automatically load the dependencies needed to make this container work successfully. Uh, here's a little bit uh, more into the architecture on what are the different components and how they work. So you would have, say, on the client side, you would say uh, implement a, um, a Docker build first. Um, Docker build will basically take the uh, code from your Git repo uh, and then push it into the Docker daemon to actually build that container image. That build then gets pulled uh, into or excuse me, the build goes to the images that are on the Docker host. So now that image is available in both the registry and the host. Next, you would pull, uh, do a pull request for additional things you might need from your registry. Remember the registries like your container images, the catalog of what you're looking for. Uh, in this case, we'll pull another image uh, into the Docker host for running as well. Uh, and then finally, we'll execute the docker run command, which allows that image to then run inside the container environment. So this is uh, pretty simplified, but you would also, as a client, not necessarily do those things on the left, like type them into a console. Your pipeline managers, your CI CD tool like Jenkins, Travis, Circle CI, whatever that pipeline manager looks like in terms of your, um, uh, your CI CD tooling, that would actually run all of that for you um, and basically be that manager of, uh, uh, of, a, of this particular deployment. You might also be uh, exploring or utilizing things like Kubernetes, which can also take over the operational aspects of Docker containers. So that all of the client commands might also be coming from Kubernetes and launching those accordingly as well. So this represents really that biggest difference between virtual machines uh, and containers and making sure that again, uh, we're really maximizing the resources that are available within these particular hosts and allowing the, the most resources available so you can actually run more containers, be more agile, be more flexible in terms of what that container uh, environment allows you to be but ultimately saving you that resource cost from all of those different guest OS running in a op, uh, normal operating system within a virtual machine. So now what this looks like in terms of architecture is your developers, again, are pushing their code changes into the code repository. Uh, you have Jenkins there as before, that's actually building the container images from the code repository. And uh, now it's, has that extra step of storing those in the container image repository. So the, it can then pull from this catalog based on a developer's um, action as part of that pipeline. They want to push it into production or push it into a deployment stage, which then Jenkins can do directly and really take over the operational side of deploying that application that typically the um, operations team would have to do in, in the previous models. So this really allows us again to integrate the developer and operations experience by using a, CD, a CI CD tool set like Jenkins. And again, uh, building in containers again gives you that flexibility over the resources and use over a uh, traditional virtualized environment. Uh, so when we're talking about Docker Hub, this is really where it comes in with that public registries. And as I mentioned, uh, in terms of ease of use from a developer's experience, a developer might not want to build out all of the, uh, in my use case or example was Apache. So they might not want to do the install of Apache, find the vulner uh, dependencies, place all of the dependencies so that Apache can run. That's already been done uh, many, many times in terms of at Docker Hub. So Docker Hub's a public repository of a number of images. Some are company supported. So you might find some Trend Micro containers uh, sitting there. Some are just uh, like one person just helping out the community by building or uh, implementing several different technologies into a single container. Uh, but they are, it tends to be the biggest base in terms of 
where people are building from uh, to save them time, as well as to allow them to be more agile. So they don't have to spend time, much like the building of a VM, going through each one of those steps of, um, you know, building the dependencies, the libraries, the operating system. You could just bring in a container where all the work has been done for you. The problem with this is that it is, even though it is the largest public repository, it's very difficult for uh, people to check every single container image and making sure that all of them are free from different threats. As you can imagine, there's a number of, say, uh, either vulnerable uh, container images that contains vulnerable applications uh, sitting within this uh, repo. Uh, there's also a number of ones that have been maliciously targeted to uh, uh, almost like a social engineering trick where you're like, hey, use this build for Apache plus this plus this. They'll save you lots of time. But the threat actor has also included something like coin mining software. Uh, and these tend to stay up for quite some time as well. So um, there was an announcement uh, when I was at DockerCon a few years back. The week of DockerCon, they were talking about um, Docker Hub images that have been downloaded millions of times that had coin mining software. Um, they were all part of the top 10 most downloaded and um, they each had a number of threats and vulnerabilities within them. Uh, so the problem is, is that this is an easy way for developers to bring in these, uh, bring in these applications, saving them lots of time, but there's no guarantee that the things found on Docker Hub are actually free from different types of threats. So this is really where security comes into play. Um, and now we'll kind of adjust and start talking about really security and how it's integrated into these processes that we just defined. Um, so there's a state of DevOps report that's um, released uh, every year. Super cool. I'm, you can get access to it just by uh, uh, you know, Googling it, uh, free download. It's not anything that's um, uh, paid for or things like that as well. But uh, we see that highly evolved organizations are 24 times more likely to automate their security policy configurations. Uh, and what this just shows is that as you start automating your security policies within these types of environments, you can actually accelerate the value that you're delivering to customers as well. Because again, if you think back to that uh, pyramid of cost as it shifts from left to right, as you move your security into the left-hand side, you're saving time and money. And again, that represents more value that you can focus on to deliver to that customer as well. Uh, Sneak also has a state of open source security report. So Sneak is responsible for uh, really making sure that open source uh, scanning is done within environments. Um, so they see that uh, the popular, the, for the ten, top 10 most popular Docker images, so the ones downloaded the most from Docker Hub or other places, they have at least 30 vulnerable system libraries. And while that might not seem like a lot, those are 30 actual holes in your application that now attackers can uh, basically find and move their way through. Uh, 44% of Docker images can fix known vulnerabilities just by updating their base image tag. Um, when you think of that base image tag, if you think back to that Docker file I showed that was running Node 11, uh, many of these Docker images have say Node 12 uh, or something similar where you can basically update the base image just by changing that 11 to 12. You're now on the latest base image tag and you've also solved 44% of those vulnerabilities just by changing one number within your Docker file. You also, 78% uh, of vulnerabilities are found with indirect dependencies. So if you had an application that had say one dependency, that dependency you would have uh, loaded within the container. But as part of that dependency install, an indirect dependency would be when that dependency also requires three other things as well. So three other dependencies based on that one dependency for your application has now turned into multiple, multiple uh, uh, vulnerabilities that are found based on those dependencies or dependencies of dependencies. 
That sounded really funny. Dependencies of dependencies. I don't think I've ever said that word so many times. Yeah, that was done. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the uh, automation and integration by performance profile, uh, really the, uh, you have the ability here to, as you automate more and more of your security, so not just automating, say, your deployment or delivery using a CI CD tool set, but also using that to automate your security tests and automate those as well, you start getting into a higher level of elite customers in terms of their performance increase within these types of environments as well. So what we don't want is uh, the developer trees or the DevOps folks creating all of this wonderful content and value, leaving security teams just uh, sitting around with a shovel and reacting to what's happening within this environment. Right, so this needs to be a collaboration in terms of, again, throwing something over the fence, creating all this magical stuff in terms of uh, all of these great features and functionality that DevOps teams are creating. Uh, we need those two teams to work together and making sure that we're delivering that value to customers together. And here's how we can do it. Um, so you might be doing some of this stuff today. Um, I would be shocked if you had a DevOps pipeline and weren't doing any of these things. Uh, please do not put that in the chat. I don't want to know that. Uh, but uh, we'll go through some different examples in terms of security tools. Uh, and again, uh, I'll just cover these in kind of a high level statement, but each one of these tool sets, we will be investigating in later webinars throughout this year as part of this five part webinar series. Uh, so if you look back at this architecture again, in terms of how we're deploying containers within our environment. You have uh, different sets uh, of things that are happening today in terms of the developments and uh, what they're creating, how they're using it, how they're pushing it into container registries, um, and also how they're deploying it into test and production environments. Um, I feel bad for the little security team and the sim on the right because there's no data flowing to them yet. Uh, as and this is a really kind of key point here as well. So if you have teams that are already doing this in a cloud environment, and I've touched on this with other presentations, if you've, if you've caught any of those, is that uh, if you say take a shadow IT DevOps team where they're taking their credit card or the BU of whatever uh, company that they're a part of, that specific BU places their credit card for some cloud spend to really accelerate the development uh, and the deployment of this value that they're trying to give customers. If they're doing all of this to hide their actions and really accelerate it, they're spinning up all this stuff in a cloud environment uh, and doing so in an agile method and again, de delivering that value to customers, there's no possible way that they're going to take all of that stuff that they're doing and then shove it back into an on-premise data center security team so InfoSec can view it and tell them to slow down and stop doing that. So the, the really that challenge comes between uh, if they're gonna not do that, because again, there's no way that they're gonna forklift all their data flow and send it back on premise for, uh, and then going through the traditional, say corporate uh, governments or security teams. Well, some people do in terms of uh, making sure that that's okay. What really needs to happen is the security team needs to be uh, really integrated with this process so the security team can get the information that they need while also the empowering themselves to deliver the security posture that developers need in terms of really shifting that cost structure left. Um, you know, we've, I've touched on it a couple times now. The earlier that you can fix these security problems in the development cycle, the more money you're saving, as well as the more value that you can then deliver to customers. So with that being said, uh, development teams are typically gonna use a bunch of, say, code development tools that they will use to, as a, I would say, the first line of defense. And these tools might not necessarily be uh, of interest in terms of a security team right away, but it's essentially it would be tool sets that they're using today to really making sure that they have say uh, code clean cleanliness or doing some analysis on their code writing abilities. Uh, first and foremost would be unit testing against their source code, making sure that say the commas are all there, the parameters are all hung 
they're all a part of uh, of their software delivery management tools. There's tons out there, uh, but this would be integrated within those types of tool sets to give you that uh, ability there. You would then have uh, static code analysis uh, or software testing as it's noted here, uh, as well as its brother, uh, dynamic code analysis uh, or software testing. Um, so this is actually looking at the logic of what your application is doing, either at a static or as the code is being, after it's compiled and ran. Uh, so these two methodologies allows you to essentially look at your application logic and making sure that the development team uh, aren't introducing things like SQL injection by um, not doing the proper logic within it as well. Uh, and then finally you have dependency scanning here, which is looking at all of those dependencies for vulnerabilities that they're bringing in within an environment. Uh, I mentioned Sneak uh, earlier. Uh, they're probably the leaders in this space in terms of dependency scanning and making sure that as the uh, different open source dependencies that you're bringing in as part of your application design, that they're all free from vulnerabilities, again, to making sure we're closing that attack hole uh, correctly. Uh, another interesting thing here is now container scanning, and this really is where security teams come into play. Because you're not affecting any of the build pipeline with a container scanner that's uh, facing the container image repository itself, this really just uh, is a start to give security teams visibility into those container images and basically uh, allowing them to uh, get visibility into vulnerabilities to malware and things like that as well. Uh, thank you, Victor, for the time check. Uh, this is my last slide, so uh, should be able to accomplish that. Uh, the other piece of container scanning is actually going directly within the build pipeline. So the build pipeline allows us uh, essentially to say, hey, the developer is building something with a vulnerability in it. Instead of letting that run and then say, uh, having some runtime tools say, hey, this is, has a vulnerability that we're blocking. Uh, instead, this, you can actually use this technology to fail the build back to a developer to allow them to, again, fix that uh, vulnerability earlier on on the cycle instead of uh, having security, you know, turn all red in the face and um, come barging into the, you know, the developer's room and, and uh, start screaming about vulnerabilities. So this helps push the security onus back into the development platform, again, to fix that sooner within that pipeline. You would then have uh, some runtime protection within your environment, in this case, something protecting the Docker engines uh, within, uh, within your uh, environment. So there's a number of tools out there that um, either walls around something that allows you not to do it, or agent uh, of some sort that's allowing you inspection into that as well. Uh, and then here's, uh, you might also introduce maybe some privileged uh, container security that's looking at other containers as well. Uh, and then finally, you'll have all of this data being pushed into a SIM and the notification channel of Slack here, but it could be other things as well. Uh, basically keeping everyone up to date uh, and notifying both the development stack and the security team. Another technology at the top, which is really interesting, the RASP, uh, Runtime Application Self-Protection, is the ability to actually wrap security around the application itself. So I know you're, you're doing some API security uh, uh, webinars and meetings um, in last week and, and the weeks coming up as well around API security. More likely than not, they'll be talking about RASP type technologies as well, because certainly those are the prime example of how you can really secure uh, those types of information. Uh, you know, I, I do work at Trend Micro, so th this is an overlay of the security solutions that we offer within this space. Again, in the coming webinars, I'll talk about the, these different architectures and technologies on what that looks like from a uh, security point of view and how to really integrate them into the different architectures that you might see within your environment. Um, and we do offer a collection of security services through a single portal. So you, based on your appetite of these security services, uh, you have the ability to, again, utilize a single place to, uh, similar to like a marketplace on a, a cloud platform on creating and clicking and, and using the security services needed to really protect the different cloud priorities that you might have within this environment. 
Um, I always like to end uh, with a smile. Um, Jailbert's one of my favorites. Um, so just uh, kind of a funny little comic here in terms of you can't always throw just new technology at a problem. It's all about that partnership between uh, individuals, uh, between different BUs. Uh, we're all people in this space and we all need to making sure that we really help each other uh, ultimately create the most value for the customers that we can, whether it's through separate development and operations and security teams. But ultimately, we want to drive towards that DevOps model where uh, essentially security is integrated directly within all the processes that you have within uh, your particular environments. Uh, with that being said, um, again, I, I love connecting with people on LinkedIn, so feel free to reach out. Um, I, I wish we could have done this in person, but I'll be seeing hopefully all of you at the next uh, in-person meeting once, the, once that happens and hopefully in the very near future. Uh, I don't see any open questions here, but certainly reach out to me. Uh, this content will all be shared. Um, I also have some learning content that uh, I'll send to Victor just to get approval that we can share as a follow-up as well. Um, so certainly uh, welcome the uh, Welcome the thing there. Uh, there was a one request for slides. Yes, I'll get that. Um, we do have a promo, not a promo. We're not selling anything for this uh, deal, but uh, we we are offering our home license for free six months for any teleworkers as well. I'll be sure to send that link uh, as well to uh, the audience uh, via the the meetup group or or through the social channels. Um, mine's on there as well, so uh, we have a, a shared that as well. So it's not a sales pitch or anything like that. We're just trying to do our part in terms of helping this global pandemic and, and stepping in where Trend Micro usually does. And it's why I, I've been a employee of the company for nearly 20 years, is they're super social responsible and really aligned in the giving back to uh, global communities as well as local communities in each of the you know, 75 countries I think we're in worldwide. So again, thank you so much for your time uh, today. And I'll just throw it over to Victor just for 